Okay, hello everyone. So today we have a pleasure to have Matthew Kwan. So he will talk about exponential many graphs are determined by their spectrum. Uh, so as usual, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself or put the question in the chat box and we let Matthew know about your question. Uh, so Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I, I also have, uh, I have two monitors so I can see anyone post things in chat so I can answer them directly as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so yes. Thank you to the uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to give this seminar. Uh, it's been a while since I've given an online talk. I'm glad to see they're still uh, still in 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 in, in full force. Um, yeah. So for some context, I am uh, definitely an imposter here. Um, honestly, I barely know what spectral geometry is, and I definitely can't call myself someone who works in the area. Um, I work on graph theory and combinatorics and 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 probability. Um, but uh, recently, um, I wrote a paper with uh, Ilya Koval about determining graphs by the spectrum, and I, I think this attracted the attention of the organizers. Um, so that's that's the story. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I was told that I should be gentle. So I, may, maybe many of you don't really know, even know what the spectrum of a graph is, or why why would I want to determine a graph by its spectrum? Um, so I'm planning on spending most of my talk giving an introduction to the topic, and I'll only say a little bit about uh, our, our new results. But before um, I, I get into the details, um, I, I, I first want to advertise my co-author, Ilya Koval, a little bit. Um, so Ilya is a PhD student here at, at, at ISTA. Um, he's actually not my student. He's a student of Vadim Kalushin. Uh, he usually works on dynamical systems, uh, but we have this rotation program here at ISTA where students get to do projects outside their usual area of research. So that's how this project happened. Um, so Ilya is really brilliant, uh, and I mean this is I mean this is a topic that I've been interested in for a while. Uh, but it was really actually Ilya who was the main driver of this project. Uh, almost all of the new ideas here are due to him, um, and he's really a lot spe closer to spectral geometry than I am. So maybe you should all keep an eye out for what uh, Ilya does in the future. Okay, so let's uh, let's introduce uh, what I'm what I'm talking about today. Um, so let's start with something that I'm sure all of you know about better than me, uh, which is hearing the shape of a drum. Um, uh, so the question here is that I fix some shape uh, in the plane um, and you make a drum with that shape and then you hit the drum. And then the question is, can you determine what shape the drum has from the sound that it makes? Um, and apparently the correct way to formalize that question um, is that you look at the eigenfrequencies of the wave equation on the drum uh, where you sort of clamp the boundary. You, you sort of enforce that the boundary has zero displacement. Um, so I, I uh, sort of only barely understand what that question means. Um, but by now, the answer to that question is kind of common knowledge among mathematicians. The answer to this question is no. And uh, the reason is just that, uh, well, here's two, two drums. Uh, they're different. Um, these were discovered by uh, Gordon, uh, Webb, and Wolpert. And if you compute the eigenfrequencies of these drums, which I have never done, uh, you will apparently discover that the spectra of these graphs are exactly, of these drums rather, are exactly the same. Um, but as we all know, this is not the end of the story. Um, there is lots more questions you can ask here. So um, uh, for example, even if I can't reconstruct the shape of a drum in general, maybe I can at least deduce some information about the shape of the drum. Like maybe I can deduce its area or its perimeter or something like that. Um, and uh, even if I can't determine the shape of every drum, maybe I can at least determine some drums by their spectrum. And maybe even I can even try to say something about those drums which cannot be reconstructed from their spectrum. Uh, can I say that those kinds of drums are somehow rare or, or must have some sort of weird structure? Um, OK, so this, this first slide is actually the last that I'll say about drums. I'm only mentioning this as motivation, uh, because what the talk is really about is uh, can you hear the shape of a graph? Um, now, the thing is that graphs don't really make a sound uh, the same way that drums make a sound. Uh, so you need to decide uh, what you mean uh, by the spectrum of a graph. And there are actually a few uh, slightly different definitions that you can make uh, that may be more or less natural, depending on your point of view. And actually, sometimes it's helpful to, to pass between different notions of the spectrum of a graph. Um, but for now, I will talk about the spectrum of the adjacency matrix. Um, which is, I think, the most well-studied uh, type of spectrum in graph theory. Um, so the definition of the adjacency matrix is, uh, is what you would expect. It's a symmetric matrix. Um, the rows and columns are indexed by the vertices. Um, 
and you, you, you put a one in the ij coordinate if there's an edge between vertex i and vertex j, and you put a zero if there's no edge between vertex i and vertex j. So it's just a binary table that records where the edges are. Um, um, now, it's not completely clear why you should care about the spectrum of this matrix, um, and I'll get to that. Um, but at least this definition does allow us to ask, uh, can you hear the shape of a graph? Um, so here is, here is the question. Um, if you know the spectrum of the adjacency matrix of a graph, is that enough information to reconstruct the graph um, up to isomorphism? So uh, this question was actually asked uh, by Kunthard and Primas uh, uh, sometime before uh, Katz asked his sort of famous question about drums. Um, and apparently this was in a paper about chemistry. Um, and the motivation, the, the reason they asked this question is, is actually still a very important motivation today. Um, they were interested in the practical task of distinguishing graphs from each other. Um, so you may know that the problem of testing whether graphs are isomorphic. So if, if you give me two graphs and you would like to know whether they are the same, um, we currently don't have any sort of provably polynomial time algorithm that can do that. Um, and we're interested in any sort of invariant that can be used to distinguish graphs that are non-isomorphic, um, especially something which can be uh, computed as, as nicely as, as, as the spectrum. OK, um, so unfortunately, uh, well, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, um, just like the drums question, uh, the answer to this question is also no. You cannot, in general, hear the shape of a graph, um, uh, because here are two examples of graphs um, which, which have the same spectrum. Um, so the drums question, it was, of course, a really big deal to disprove that question. Um, but to disprove the graphs question is not very hard because graphs are discrete objects. Um, so you just need to do a computational search on small graphs. So uh, I think Kolatz and Sigonowitz were, uh, were sort of cataloging the spectra of all graphs and just observed that there were two graphs which, uh, which have the same spectrum. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe uh, just to make sure we all understand all the definitions. So uh, the adjacency matrix here, so here in, in this example, uh, this vertex three is adjacent to everything except itself. So hence the, the third row and the third column here are all ones except, except the, the middle one, which because it's not adjacent to itself. And then the second example here, this third vertex is isolated, is adjacent to nothing. So you have zeros uh, in, the, in, the, in the row and column there. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, so the, the graphs question uh, has basically the same status as the drums question. And we can ask basically the same sorts of follow-up questions. So, you know, even if we can't reconstruct a graph in general, um, you know, what kind of information can we get, obtain from the spectrum? And you know, we can still hope that some graphs can be determined by the spectrum, and to try and say something about about that class of graphs. Um, yeah. So before um, getting too deep into these questions, um, I think uh, it would be a good idea to say a little bit about. Um, what the spectrum of a graph sort of means and, uh, and, and, and what, what combinatorial significance it has. Um, so I'm going to try my best to give you a very quick uh, sort of overview or taste of, of, of that on the next few slides. Um, uh, yeah, so, so a priori, there's really no reason why the, the spectrum should tell you anything interesting about a graph. Um, a priori, the eigenvalues are just some arbitrary numbers you can associate with the graph. Like, there's no clear reason why putting ones where the edges are and zeros where there aren't is, is a sensible thing. Um, but by some miracle, um, the eigenvalues do tell you all sorts of useful combinatorial information. Uh, there's Especially, there's all sorts of inequalities in terms of uh, things like the maximum eigenvalue or the minimum eigenvalue or the second largest eigenvalue that are really useful, um, uh, really fundamental tools in graph theory. And so I've prepared a few examples here. Um, so these first two uh, examples are pretty simple ones, um, just relating the maximum eigenvalue to some sort of standard parameters of a graph. Um, roughly speaking, uh, if a graph has a large eigenvalue, then it must have a lot of edges. Um, and these are two different senses in which that's true. Um, so the first uh, theorem here is 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 a sort of a a, a local inequality, um, saying that uh, there has to be a vertex with many edges uh, incident to it, and the second is a bit more of a global inequality, saying that the the total number of edges has to be large when you've got a large eigenvalue. Um, this third example here is a very famous one called the expander mixing lemma. Um, uh, which relates spectrograph theory to expander graphs. 
Um, so if you have a deregular graph, meaning if you have a graph where every vertex has exactly D neighbors, um, if in that graph, um, the second largest eigenvalue is not very large, um, then the expander mixing lemma tells you that the graph is a very good expander, um, uh, which has all sorts of implications in uh, graph theory and computer science. Um, to be precise, uh, this statement here says that for any pair of vertex subsets S and T, um, the number of edges between these subsets uh, basically only depends on the, the, the size of the subjects of the subsets I choose. So the number of edges between S and T is basically equal to this expression, D times the size of S times the size of T divided by N up to some error term, which depends on the second largest eigenvalue. That's the second example. And this final example is one that I've included because uh, I am personally rather interested in graph cuts. Um, so it, it says that if, you, if the minimum eigenvalue of a graph is not very negative, so the eigenvalues could, could be negative, but if the minimum one is not too negative, um, then there is no way to cut the graph into two parts um, such that there's sort of an un unusually large number of edges going between the two parts. Um, yeah. So this is just a small sample of the literature. And actually, I won't be discussing, well, I won't be saying much about any of these theorems again. Um, but this is sort of reason one uh, why someone might care about the spectrum of a graph, at, at least for graph theoretic purposes. Um, just because in practice, it tells you useful information about a graph. If I want to know something about cuts or expansion, it might help to compute the spectrum and see what that tells me. Um, uh, and then uh, reason two why someone might want to study the spectrum is that um, perhaps surprisingly, um, there is actually a combinatorial interpretation of, of, the of all the information that's in the spectrum. Uh, so namely, the spectrum of a graph is nothing more than the number of closed walks of each length. Um, so let's, uh, let's go through what's, what's, what's written on this slide here. Um, uh, so first, I observe that the sum of kth powers of eigenvalues of A um, is nothing more than the trace of the, the kth power of the adjacency matrix. Um, now, remember, um, in the adjacency matrix, I put a 1 if there's an edge between two vertices, and I put a 0 if there's no edge. Um, so in the kth power of the matrix, um, the, the, the ij entry is going to count how many ways are there to walk between vertex i and vertex j in k steps, where at each step you walk along an edge of the graph. Um, that's just a combinatorial interpretation of the powers of the adjacency matrix. And so what that means is that this, the, the trace is the sum of the diagonal entries. Uh, uh, sorry, the trace, which is the sum of the diagonal entries, is the number of closed walks uh, of, of, of length k. The, the, the sum of uh, kth powers of eigenvalues is uh, just a rescaled version of the kth moment of the spectral distribution, so namely the, the, the uniform distribution on the eigenvalues. Um, and uh, we know from uh, probability theory that finitely supported probability distributions are determined by their moments. Um, so we have proved uh, on this slide um, that the spectrum of A, um, so if you know the, all the eigenvalues with multiplicity, that's equivalent information to knowing the number of closed walks of each length. Um, yeah, so the, the spectrum is, 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 is the same as the number of uh, closed walks of each length. And just to give a little bit of uh, further context for that, it turns out that this is a part of a, of, of a general theory uh, on, on, on homomorphism profiles. Um, so uh, a graph homomorphism, uh, so from a, a graph H to a graph G, is just a map from the vertices of H to the vertices of G, such that the edge relation is preserved. Uh, so that means for every edge in H, the two vertices of that edge map to two vertices in G that, that also form an edge. And this is a really important notion in graph theory, and it has all the properties that you might uh, want, a want a homomorphism to have. Um, and so then for a, for a set of graphs, uh, curly H, um, the H homomorphism profile is a list of numbers. It tells you for every graph H in curly H, um, how many homomorphisms are there from, from H to G. Um, so it's a, it's a famous theorem of, of, of Lovas um, that uh, if H is the set of all graphs, all finite graphs, um, then the homomorphism profile can be used to distinguish graphs up to homomorphism. And so if you know the, the, the number of homomorphisms from all graphs into, into G, that's enough information to tell you what G is. And uh, yeah, this was actually the starting point for uh, uh, the development of, of, of something called a graph limit theory. Um, yeah, and it's 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 not hard to see that the the spectrum of a graph, uh, at least the is equivalent information 
um, to the homomorphism profile with respect to cycles. Um, so I just want to say that the, this, this question of hearing the shape of a graph, um, this fits into uh, sort of a very general theory, uh, a theory that's actually kind of still being uh, developed. Okay. Um, Anyway, so that, that was uh, some, some kind of introduction to why someone might care about the spectrum of a graph. Um, so let's return to hearing, uh, hearing, the shape, uh, hearing, hearing the shape of a graph. So we know that not all graphs are determined by the spectrum, um, but we'd like to understand uh, which ones are. Um, so as a very basic example, let's consider uh, complete graphs. Um, so, so Kn is the graph with uh, n vertices where we put all of the possible edges between those vertices. Um, so there's n vertices and there's n choose two. That's n times n minus one times two edges, all the possible edges are present. Um, and this graph is determined by its spectrum because it's the only graph which has that many vertices and that many edges. Um, so you can determine both the number of vertices and the number of edges from the spectrum. So the number of vertices is just the number of eigenvalues um, or a, Alternatively, you can think of it as the number of closed walks of length zero, um, if you want to think about the, the closed walk interpretation of eigenvalues. Uh, that's the number of vertices, and then the number of edges is just the number of closed walks of length two uh, divided by two. Because the only way you can have a closed walk of length two in a graph is by walking back and forth along an edge. And this double counts the edges, because I could start from, from either side. OK, so uh, yeah, so this is uh, the, the question. Uh, so, so sorry. So, yeah. So, the the, the key difference between uh, drums and graphs is that uh, because uh, graphs are discrete objects, you can count them. Um, so, a natural question is to ask how many graphs on n vertices are determined by their spectrum, and we can't really hope for an exact formula here, but we can at least ask for lower bounds and upper bounds, or we can at least ask for the proportion of graphs which are determined by their spectrum. Um, so, let's define rho n to be that proportion. Um, the fraction of unlabeled and vertex graphs which are determined by their spectrum. Yeah. So it was a very old conjecture in spectral graph theory that this proportion is basically zero. Um, so as n goes to infinity, this proportion of rho n goes to zero. Uh, it seems that the first person who explicitly made this conjecture was uh, Alan Schwenk in uh, 1973. Um, so at the time, the, the main evidence for this conjecture, the, the reason uh, that he conjectured this was mostly just that it seemed that reconstructing graphs from the spectrum is, is really hard. Um, so, so here in this example, this complete graph, we can reconstruct it from a spectrum, but that's due to a very special property of this complete graph, just that it's the only graph with this number of vertices and this number of edges. And there's actually a very short list of graphs where we have a proof like this, um, that, that sort of the, the, the spectrum is, the, the graph is determined by a spectrum for some sort of combinatorial statistical reason. Um, yeah, so that's how things were, but, but, but since that time, um, computers have gotten better and we can start to collect numerical evidence. Um, for, so for small n, we can really just generate all graphs on n vertices and just check how many of those are the only graph in their isomorphism class with, with, uh, sorry, are the only graph, uh, are the only isomorphism class with, 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 with a given spectrum. Um, so you can really only do this for small graphs um, because the combinatorial explosion in the number of n-vertex graphs is, is quite severe. Um, but uh, in 2003, it, uh, I guess the evidence had become strong enough that uh, Hamers and Van Damme uh, boldly conjectured that the limit is actually uh, one, that almost all graphs are determined by their spectrum. So I think this is one of the uh, more important open questions in spectral graph theory. Um, and no one really has, uh, no one really knows what the answer is, but, but I tend to believe the second conjecture um, that uh, almost all graphs are determined by the spectrum. Okay, so let me tell you about some of the previous work in this area. Um, so it's, it's, it's much easier to prove that a graph is not determined by its spectrum than that it is determined by its spectrum. Because if I want to prove a graph is not determined by its spectrum, I just need to show how to somehow change the graph, maybe make some local perturbation to it, um, without changing the spectrum. Um, and it turns out that's uh, especially easy to do for trees. Um, and so the first big result in this area was a theorem of Schrenk um, that almost all trees are not determined by the spectrum because I can make some local change um, and, and, and keep the spectrum. So for, for general graphs, it's harder to do this. Um, but uh, famously, there is a local operation called Godzilla McKay switching. Um, 
which uh, under some quite general conditions uh, tells you how to make uh, a sort of local change to a graph without changing a spectrum. And they use this operation to show that there are lots and lots of graphs which are not determined by their spectrum. Um, so in fact, um, among all the graphs on n vertices, at least a, a, a two to the minus n fraction uh, of them share their spectrum with another graph. So this is an exponentially small fraction, um, but it's actually lots and lots and lots of graphs um, because the total number of graphs on n vertices is about two to the n squared. So out of that many, an exponentially small fraction is in some sense, uh, in sort of some logarithmic sense, almost all of them. Yeah, so the, 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 the logarithm of the number of graphs on n vertices, which are not determined by the spectrum, is asymptotically the same as the logarithm of the total number of graphs on n vertices. So, so these two conjectures that, you know, whether almost none or almost all graphs are determined by the spectrum, um, if the second conjecture is true, which I tend to believe it is, it's sort of only barely true. It's not true in the exponent. Um, um, yeah, so the progress in the other direction uh, has been much more modest. Um, so despite the fact that probably almost all graphs are determined by the spectrum, until recently, we only had uh, two to the square root n examples of graphs that are determined by the spectrum. Um, so only a, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of graphs were known to be determined by the spectrum. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in, in case you're curious, uh, these, uh, these graphs are disjoint unions of, of complete graphs. Uh, so the, the graphs in which each of the connected components is, uh, is, is, is a complete graph. Um, so the graphs that look like this are enumerated by integer partitions uh, because you, it's completely determined by the size of each, uh, of each complete graph. Um, so by the hardy ramanujan uh, theorem on counting integer partitions, there's roughly two to the square root n of them. So only some very special types of graphs uh, are known to be determined by the spectrum. And I should say that this sounds like a, a, an, an easy theorem. Um, but just uh, given the definition of the spectrum, it's, it's not at all obvious how you should prove this because the spectrum doesn't immediately tell you much about connected components. Um, so if you remember on the first slide, we saw an example of two graphs which had the same spectrum and one of those was connected and one of those wasn't. So uh, in fact, one of them even had an isolated vertex and you can't see this from the spectrum. So you have to you have to work for this uh, for this theorem, um, and uh, finally uh, let me mention uh, in in the history some some computational work. Um, so we've managed to enumerate all graphs on up to twelve vertices. Um, so I don't have all the numbers on the slide, but uh, I'll just say that eighty one percent of the graphs on twelve vertices are determined by their spectrum, and that's more that's a higher proportion than the number of graphs on 11 vertices that are determined by the spectrum. So it looks like the trajectory is upwards. It's very limited numerical evidence, but it seems like a pretty reasonable guess that this number is going towards uh, 100%. Like the spectrum is very rich information and, and uh, somehow it determines uh, almost all graphs, but, 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 but who knows? Okay, um, so our new result um, is, uh, you know, in some sense, kind of modest compared to what the conjecture was, um, but we managed to prove that uh, exponentially many graphs are determined by the spectrum. So namely, there is some constant C um, such that the number of n vertex graphs determined by the spectrum um, is at least, uh, is at least uh, two, to the, two to the power of uh, Cn. Um, yeah, so the, the proof strategy, um, as you might guess, is to construct a very special family of graphs um, such that on the one hand, um, these graphs can all be reconstructed from their spectrum. And on the other hand, there's sort of uh, enough flexibility in these graphs that there's exponentially many of them. Um, so, so this is an example. Um, this is one of the graphs in our family. Uh, this thing uh, we have proved is determined by its spectrum. Um, so yeah, I should mention that there's, a, there's really a, a kind of vicious tension here um, that we have really very, very limited techniques to reconstruct a graph from its spectrum. Uh, we really need some very particular structure in our graph to have, to have any chance. Um, but if the graph has such special structure, then there's sort of not enough freedom uh, for there to be many of them uh, in the family. Um, so this is, uh, this is not an easy proof. It's not a very sort of uh, natural uh, proof somehow. This is a proof where you sort of have to delicately balance all sorts of conditions and take advantage of all sorts of numerical coincidences and really just throw a bunch of tools from spectral graph theory this problem until you've managed to determine the graph. Um, uh, yeah, but that, but that said, the proof is uh, almost completely combinatorial. Um, so the proof is basically an algorithm. It's a combinatorial algorithm 
that uh, gradually restricts the structure of your graph more and more uh, using sort of combinatorial information that you can get from the spectrum um, until you can pin down what the graph is. Um, the only non-combinatorial ingredients, the only sort of non-purely combinatorial ingredients um, are where are, are um, well, first, um, there's this uh, very powerful structure theorem uh, for, uh, for graphs whose minimum eigenvalue is at least minus two. Um, so it, it turns out that there's not very many ways for a graph uh, to have minimum eigenvalue very close to zero. And you can actually kind of catalog all the different ways that you can have that. Um, so this is proved using some inputs from the theory of root systems. And that's going to be very important for us. Um, and also prime numbers are uh, super useful uh, for these kinds of problems um, because spectral graph theory has various theorems giving combinatorial meaning to products of eigenvalues. Um, and uh, so if you have a, a product of integers and it's got a large prime factor, there's sort of that, that prime factor sort of has to come from somewhere and you can, you can sort of use that to reconstruct certain information about your graph. Um, so, so, so a, a bit of number theoretic information is useful, always very elementary number theoretic information, but we need some strengthening of the prime number theorem uh, to guarantee that uh, there are many ways to choose graphs with certain parameters being prime. Okay. Um, and, and I also want to mention that I think, uh, I think that our theorem is, is, is uh, basically the limit of what you can do with direct combinatorial reconstruction arguments. Um, so I think if you want to prove a bound that is better than exponential, um, you'll have to have some very new ideas. And the reason is that uh, this kind of combinatorial reconstruction algorithm, it's like I ask a sequence of yes or no questions, uh, each of which is, 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 I'm asking questions about some parameter that I can get from the spectrum. Um, and each of those has a, you know, just two answers, yes or no, or at least some small number of possible answers. And then the algorithm is bifurcating based on the answer to each of these questions. So if you if you ask n questions, there are there are two to the n possible outcomes of the the of what 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 graph you can reconstruct in the end. Um, but there's really only about n combinatorial parameters that you get from the spectrum. Um, so like we talked about how uh, the, the 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 spectrum is the same information as the number of closed walks of each length. Well, so you get the number of closed walks of each length up to n, but beyond that, that's actually redundant information. So it's not really sensible to talk about closed walks of length uh, more than n. So it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to imagine a combinatorial reconstruction argument that has more than exponentially many different outcomes um, based on just looking at combinatorial parameters of, that you can get from the spectrum. Um, so I think it would be super interesting to go beyond exponential. Um, just uh, if you can put an, an n, uh, like uh, n to the one plus epsilon on the exponent instead of n, I think that that's uh, that that would require some some rather new ideas. Okay, um, so before I tell you about uh, some of the proof ideas, I think it's informative to compare this problem with some other famous combinatorial reconstruction problems um, to give a bit more of an idea of of the difficulties of this problem. Um, so the most famous uh, problem in this area is the is the graph reconstruction conjecture of uh, Kelly and Ulam which says that if you tell me all the subgraphs you can get by deleting a single vertex, um, so this information, this collection of uh, n subgraphs, that's enough information to reconstruct the graph. And this is very much an open problem, but there are several different ways to prove it for almost all graphs. So at least for almost all graphs, you can do this. The first proof of this was uh, due to Bolabash. And another famous uh, problem in this area is uh, shotgun assembly, um, where I tell you the, the, the local neighborhood of each vertex. Um, so the first big theorem proved in this area um, by Mossel and Ross um, is that if you tell me what the graph looks like up to distance two from each vertex. So if I sort of expand out, if I look at the vertices that are, that are my neighbors and the vertices that are those vertices neighbors, and I look at the graph induced on those, if I tell you this for each vertex, then for almost all graphs, that's enough information to reconstruct the thing. Yeah. Um, so the difference between these problems and our spectral problem um, is that in, in both these problems, uh, the kind of information that you're presented with is fundamentally local information. Um, so you have lots of pieces of your graph and you can try and patch them together. It's kind of like you know, a jigsaw puzzle or something. Um, but the spectrum is completely different. It's fundamentally global information. And it's really not obvious how to even get started on reconstructing a graph from the spectrum. Like if I, if I tell you that a graph, you know, it's got some number of closed walks of length five, and it's a good expander graph and it's got no cuts of some size, like how, how, how can I possibly even start to use that sort of information to, to tell you what the graph is? 
Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so I, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, about our proof. I mean, I definitely don't have time uh, to go into all the details, but I'll I'll tell you a few of the ingredients. Um, the first thing is that there's a, a few different notions of the spectrum of a graph, um, which all give you slightly different information, and you can do different things with these different types of information. It's very helpful to pass between these. Um, so let's make some definitions. Um, so I'm going to write D of G um, for the degree matrix of a graph, um, which is just a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are the number of neighbors of each vertex. Um, so here, the first vertex has one neighbor. So vertex one has one neighbor, so I put a one there. In fact, all the vertices have one neighbor except vertex three here, which has, uh, which has four neighbors. So I put a four there. And then I define the Laplacian matrix um, to be the adjacency matrix minus the degree matrix. Um, and the signless Laplacian matrix is the absolute value of that is the adjacency matrix plus the plus the degree plus the degree matrix. Um, and uh, in case you are wondering, uh, the name uh, Laplacian is not a coincidence. Um, you can use this matrix um, to represent something called the the discrete Laplacian operator, um, which takes as input some numerical function of the vertices, and then outputs the sum of squares of differences of this function along all the edges of your graph. Um, so this is uh, the discrete analog of uh, the Laplacian, like the Laplace Beltrami operator in the continuous world, which I know little about. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, the connection is there, but we, we don't actually use anything from, from uh, the continuous world in this. Uh, in this. Anyway, so, so, so I have several different matrices associated with each graph. Um, I have the adjacency matrix, the Laplacian matrix, and the signless Laplacian matrix. And these give me three different notions of spectrum. So adjacency, Laplacian, and signless Laplacian spectrum. Yeah, so as I said, there's uh, some important relationships between these notions of spectrum, and we'll need to move between them in the proof. Um, uh, but before I talk about the relationships, um, let's uh, let's mention this important fact. So yeah, so these don't these notions of spectrum give you very different kinds of information. Um, so we we saw that the adjacency matrix tells you the number of closed walks of various length, and a really important property of the Laplacian spectrum is that it tells you whether a graph is connected or not. Um, so you just need to count how many times zero appears as an eigenvalue in the spectrum. Uh, that'll tell you whether the graph is connected. Um, and that's really important uh, because once we know that a graph is connected, it sort of uh, gives us some kind of starting point for what the graph looks like. And we can sort of start identifying features of the graph and build them out to reconstruct the graph um, using the kind of statistical information we can get from the adjacency spectrum. Um, so for example, if you know that a graph uh, it has the same number of edges and vertices, you know that there's a single cycle and there's like trees hanging off the cycle. Like you have these, these types of, uh, uh, this is true for connected graphs. You have some way to build out structure using, uh, using statistics. Okay, so what are the different, uh, what are the connections between the different notions of spectrum? Um, well, there's lots to say about this, but for now, let me just say a little bit. Um, so the first observation is that if a graph is bipartite, then it's, Laplacian spectrum and its signless Laplacian spectrum are the same. Um, and the second observation is that if you know the signless Laplacian spectrum of a graph, then you know the adjacency spectrum of its line graph. Since we're not all graph theorists, let's uh, quickly define uh, all the words there. Um, so we say that a graph is bipartite if its vertices can be broken up into two parts, such that every edge is across the, the two parts of the cut. Um, so one vertex in one part, the other vertex in the other part. Um, and the definition of the line graph is, uh, is, is, is well, it's written here. Um, so the line graph is an auxiliary graph where the vertices of the line graph are the edges of the original graph. And in the line graph, you, you, you make two vertices be neighbors if the corresponding edges of the original graph um, uh, share a vertex. Um, so here's an example. Um, so this is the line graph of this graph is this graph. So this edge corresponds to this vertex and this edge corresponds to this vertex and so on. And the, the reason there's no edge between the green vertex here and the orange vertex here is because this green edge here and this orange vertex here don't share, don't share a vertex. They don't touch each other. Yeah, so these are both really simple facts and uh, they basically just follow from the definitions. I, 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 if I gave you 30 seconds to think about them, I'm sure you would see why they're true. Um, I realized that the, de the definitions were on the previous slide and they're gone now, um, but uh, I promise these are, these are, these are easy facts. Um, yeah, so, so this, this uh, suggests um, the, the, the following idea. Um, 
if we uh, restrict ourselves um, to only ever think about line graphs of bipartite graphs, then we can try to move between these different notions of spectrum to take advantage of all the different types of information that you can get from these different spectra. So in particular, we can try to use both connectivity information from the Laplacian spectrum and cycle counting information from, or closed walk counting information from the, uh, from the adjacency spectrum. So this is, this is not a new idea. This is a, a fairly standard type of thing to try and do. And if you look in the literature about which graphs are known to be determined by the spectrum, lots of them turn out to be line graphs of bipartite graphs for this sort of reason. Um, but even in this special case of line graphs and bipartite graphs, it's not free to move between these different notions of spectrum um, because the spectrum does not have enough information to tell you whether you're bipartite and it doesn't have enough information to tell you whether you're a line graph. So even if we're only interested in line graphs of bipartite graphs, you know, maybe we would be able to show that there is no other line graph of a bipartite, bipartite graph which has the same spectrum, but we also need to consider the possibility that there is some graph which is not the line graph of a bipartite graph, which somehow has the same spectrum as, as my graph. Um, and there is no standard way to do this. You need to find some kind of situation specific arguments to rule out graphs, which are not line graphs of, of bipartite graphs. Anyway, so I don't want to uh, go really much more into depth than that. So I'm going to give you just a one, uh, a quick one slide summary of how the proof comes together. Um, so the proof is quite complicated. So this is just sort of a snapshot of some of the ideas. Um, and uh, I'm definitely going to be oversimplifying some things. Uh, so so the, the, the first thing is that uh, you need to define a certain family of graphs, um, which I'm going to define curly G. Um, so there needs to be exponentially many graphs in this family. Um, they're all going to be, well, and, and each of them is going to be a, a long cycle with leaves attached to it. So the leaves are going to sometimes be individual leaves like this and sometimes be sort of pairs of leaves coming off a, a vertex. Now, we need to make this definition uh, of curly G in such a way that for any graph G in curly G, um, if you have some other graph H and you know that H is connected and it has the same number of closed walks of all lengths as G, the only way that can happen is if H is isomorphic to G. Um, so that is to say, the graphs in G would be determined by the spectrum if you had some way of showing that any graph with the same spectrum as, as, as G is, is connected. So connectivity, so adj the adjacency matrix doesn't tell you connectedness. So this, this is not the end on its own, but this is a step in the proof. And roughly speaking, the reason this is true is that you can reconstruct the graph from parity considerations. So you know we've got these double leaves and we've got these single leaves. Um, and when you're counting closed walks, so when you're counting ways to walk along the edges of a graph and come back to where you started, if, if a closed walk involves one of these double leaves, uh, then there'll be two ways, the, 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 like the, the, these closed walks will come in pairs. Any way to go into one leaf could also have gone to the other leaf. So this will, you'll get like a factor of two whenever your walk involves one of these uh, closed walks, of, uh, when, when, whenever your closed walk involves one of these uh, double leaves. Um, so if you know the number of closed walks of each length, then you can do some sort of parity considerations uh, by looking at the number of closed walks mod two or the number of closed walks divided by something really mod two. Um, and by these sorts of parity configurations, you can figure out what is the contribution from closed walks involving just the single leaf and sort of you can sort of decode what the graph looks like by sort of looking at longer and longer closed walks. You can sort of figure out how the, this, the single leaf is sort of situated relative to all the other double leaves on the cycle. Um, yeah, so as you can imagine, this is quite complicated and I'm, I'm skipping a lot of details, but there are exponentially many ways to, to sort of put things together like this, to sort of decide on the spacings between these uh, double leaves relative to the single leaf at the start. And the next task is that we somehow need to connect things to the Laplacian spectrum, because remember we need connectedness to, 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 to do this. We need connectedness to know that there is a single sort of cycle with stuff hanging off of it. Um, and uh, we need Laplacian spectrum for that. Um, so uh, remember to go to the Laplacian spectrum, we need to go to via the signless Laplacian spectrum, which is related to the adjacency, to the adjacency spectrum of the line graph. Um, so here is where we use that structure theorem that I mentioned earlier um, on graphs whose minimum eigenvalue is at least uh, minus two. Um, to show that if a graph has the same adjacency spectrum as the line graph of some G in curly G, um, well, then that graph has to be a line graph. 
So there can't be any sort of uh, imitators which have the same spectrum, but are not a line graph. Um, and so in order to rule out certain other possibilities, so the, the, the structure theorem will tell you, will give you some sort of classification of what can happen. And you need to rule out lots of those possibilities. And it turns out that a determinant, a determinant calculation is enough here. So the determinant is obviously determined by its spectrum and, and you can use this to distinguish different possibilities. Um, okay, so I haven't added anything here. This slide is just making the previous slide uh, more compact. Um, yeah, so once, once we've narrowed things down to line graphs, um, we need to show that every line graph um, with the same spectrum as the line graph of G must come from a graph with the same signless Laplacian spectrum of, of, as G. And then we need to somehow prove bipartiteness to show that that's the same as the Laplacian spectrum. And it turns out that we were only able to manage that if, if our graph G has a prime number of vertices. Um, uh, and I don't want to say too much about that, but as I said earlier, it's, it's roughly speaking, it's because we can give a combinatorial interpretation to certain products of eigenvalues. So these, product, these, these certain products of eigenvalues can be said to count stuff actually to count sort of subgraphs which have certain properties. Um, and if this product has a large prime factor, um, that prime factor needs to come from one of your connected components. And that's a very useful thing to narrow down the structure of your graph. If it's got a very large prime factor, there must be sort of a large component. Um, yeah, so this is what you do when n is prime. Um, and uh, when n is not prime, I need to somehow augment it to give it more vertices uh, without ruining the fact that this graph is determined by its spectrum. Um, yeah, so this part is the part that needs a little bit of number theory. Um, so we need to know that there are certain primes available which have certain residues mod four. It turns out that's what's, uh, that's what's relevant here. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's actually all I really wanna say about the proof. Um, and I realized that was perhaps impossible to follow, um, but maybe at least give some flavor of the types of things that you can do in this area. Um, so I want to end uh, with some further directions. So I think there are lots of interesting directions for further research. I think this is a very sort of, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff to do here. And uh, maybe the audience would have some suggestions for some more because, uh, you know, these, these types of questions on hearing the shape of a drum, I mean, I think graph theorists don't really know super well what's happening on the continuous side of things. And, and maybe there's some inspiration that can be taken from, from there. Um, so the first question is, uh, we know that there are exponentially many graphs that are determined by the spectrum. It would be interesting if we could prove the same thing for trees. Um, so this would prove that among the exponentially many trees, um, exponentially many of those are determined by the by their spectrum and exponentially many are not. Uh, this, is, this is currently not known. Um, the, the second question here uh, is much easier than showing that graphs are determined by the spectrum. Uh, simply, how many possible spectra of graphs um, are there? Um, so I don't think uh, anyone has thought very deeply about this question before. Um, it's easy to get an exponential bound in lots of different ways, um, but I, I, I'm not sure how easy it is to get a super exponential bound. Can I show that there are more than exponentially many uh, different possible spectra? There's some closely related questions about the, the, the counting the possible determinants of, of matrices. Um, um, so another, another question uh, motivated by some similar questions in random graph theory is if, if I generate two graphs at random, how likely is it that they'll have the same spectrum? Um, so obviously if they are isomorphic graphs, they're going to have the same spectrum. Uh, and so that's gonna give some lower bound on this probability. And maybe that lower bound is actually asymptotically the correct probability. Um, so I think it should be possible to show that this probability is exponentially small, um, but I think it would be interesting to prove any kind of super exponential bound. Um, and then if you want, you can drop the graphs entirely and just talk about spectra of binary matrices. Um, so it was conjectured by Van Vu um, that almost all binary matrices are determined by the spectrum. He calls this the fingerprint conjecture. And uh, our techniques are not suitable for this um, because we can't make the same sorts of combinatorial interpretations for general matrices. Um, and finally, from talking to uh, uh, Vadim Kaloshin and his group at ISTA here, um, I do have one idea inspired by the continuous world, which is, uh, can you prove some kind of spectral rigidity result? Um, so can I prove that for almost all graphs, if I just make a little change to a graph, then that's, that's probably going to change the spectrum. Um, 
So it's not too hard to prove some bounds on this problem um, using known results on the determinants of random matrices. Um, but I think it would be quite interesting to try and prove optimal bounds here. I, thought, I think this is a direction that uh, hasn't really been uh, thought about yet. Yeah. OK, so that's, that's, the, end of my, uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew, for your nice talk. So if uh, anyone has question or comment, you can unmute yourself. You mentioned a kind of a switching procedure that gave you isospectral graphs. Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, years ago, Bob Brooks um, had a uh, what he called Seidel switching, which was a procedure that would give a pair of isospectral graphs. Is this the same thing by a different name, or is this another? I think it's very closely related. I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing. So this this the Seidel matrix, it's easier to have. Um, it's easier to have graphs with the same spectrum under the Seidel matrix than the adjacency matrix. So I think the Godzilla case switching is a little bit more restricted, a little bit more complicated, but it's a similar kind of concept. Any other question? I'm sorry, may maybe I can ask. Yeah, uh, uh, go ahead, Pava. Yeah, so my question is the following. Uh, but what about graphs which are not which are not determined by the spectrum? Do you have some conjecture about symmetry or something like this? Right, so it's it's this 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 work of Godzilla McKay shows there's many of them. Um, uh, I'm not sure what exactly. So so whenever you have some sort of uh, local structure, then you can twist it to make it to change that local structure a little bit to make it not to make to give to give something different which has the same spectrum. Um, so from that point of view, there's a very rich. There's graphs that look like almost anything which are not determined by the spectrum. Yeah, exactly. If you have a symmetry, then then you have isospectral graphs. But can you prove a different thing that if there is a spectrum, then there is something behind? So I certainly don't know anything in this direction, uh, uh, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not so sure what I would want to prove here. It's a good question. I don't, I don't, have, an, I don't have an answer for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, any other question or comment? Actually, uh, I do have a question. So, um, so if you add weight to the edges, so uh, I know that for for the Laplacian, it's you can construct uh, um, any like sequence of eigenvalues on a complete graph. If, and with, uh, so, so if edges are weighted, uh, what is known? I actually know very little about uh, what happens in the weighted case. Uh... So you're telling me that in the weighted case, you can't hope for anything sensible for the Laplacian, but maybe you can for the adjacency matrix? Is that uh, no, we is cannot that... uh, hope anything sensible for, for the Laplacian, but for adjacency matrix, I don't know if. Uh, so basically, if you give me a sequence of numbers for the Laplacian, we can build a weight and the, on a complete graph such that it has this sequence as a spectrum. So. Uh, mm. This is the result of uh, Colendoverdia, but uh, I don't know if this is the same kind of result. Or... Um, I am not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, if there is no more question or comment, so let's uh, thank Matthew again. And uh, so, and next week we have. Uh, uh, Denis Grebenkov. So he, he will talk about probabilistic and numerical insight into a spectral property of Dirichlet to Neumann operator. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining.